and to feel um, wise to have random fun facts to show, to prove that <laughs> we've experienced life some. There's something to share. Coffee table conversations or the dinner, dinner party monologues, just holding on to information. Some hold on to information for defense. So I got to protect myself from this and that. And I've armed myself with this information, this knowing. And I go around swinging this sword of information as if I'm defending myself from myself to ensure I don't get misled or somebody try to pull the wool over my eyes. I got my BS meter on and I'm kind of protecting myself from all these liars and people trying to deceive me and it's like well <laughs> life doesn't necessarily have to be a battle it doesn't have to be a war it doesn't have to be you against everyone else and you holding on to information that's um that's no fun it sounds like a prison sentence that sounds like hell to get up every day and defend yourself from yourself that is that is truly the hell planes. But once again, this is a this is something that we hold on to, programs, limitation. Feeling that we're here to battle ourselves through something. As we heal, we become sophisticated enough to recognize that God is a lot more intelligent than that. It's more intelligent than having to fight oneself, to defend oneself. Talk about that a little later too. But the idea is to don this innocence, to wake up with an open heart. That innocence of a child, that innocence of a child is where you have access to the gates of heaven. It's a metaphor, and yet it has a religious connotation to it. Yet and still, the essence of that message holds true today, to this day. Innocence. Your acceptance of self. Your acceptance of your own design. Well, this is the greatest story ever told, and you're the main character. You're the main character of this story. You have the support of the entirety of the universe. God has no opponents. So who are we defending ourselves from again? Who are we protecting ourselves from once again? Oh, fear. Yeah, no doubt. Well, that's a matter of awareness. What happens when you cut a light switch on in a room? <laughs> it could be a 30 watt. It could be a 20 watt. It could be a 40 watt. Sometimes you're working with a 60 watt. Sometimes it's an 80 watt. But regardless of what the wattage is, when you hit the light switch, there's no room for darkness in the room. Once you hit the light switch, that was all that was necessary. Just to hit the light switch. There's no room for darkness when the light is on. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. Everywhere in that room, light is omnipresent. <laughs> so the illusion says, some days the lights are out. Once again, the illusion says that. The heart knows the light never goes out. Even in physical death, the light doesn't go out. Because once again, physical death is an illusion as well. The light never goes out. They say, the sun don't chill out here. That's true. We say that on the block. The sun don't chill, bro. The sun don't chill. What you mean? Even in, even at the night, even at nighttime, the sun don't chill. It's shining somewhere. The moon is the proof of the light shining somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. The sun never chills. Such is the illusion. Let's talk about this transition. 
that we're experiencing. For the most part, the mind identity and this observation of the unfolding experience, linear time, if you will, it feels there's a process and things that are necessary for us to do. This to-do list, this planning, this uh, this mental conversation. It can be haunting sometimes. <laughs> a person can sit here and provide you with a thousand motivational speeches back to back about the nature of your experience, yet and still this voice of the ego will always come back. Why? Well, that which is being said has to be truly processed and embodied. This is the difference. Intellectual comprehension and receptivity and actual embodiment, actually doing the work. So we'll always have to come back for a dose of the same message because there's no real grounding. We kind of received the information and, you know, got hype amongst the conversation. But we necessarily embody the information or at least attempt to implement the practices. Recognize the importance of this being a proactive experience versus us just kind of having this conversation over and over again. There are things to do. There is acceptance to practice, to implement. And most of the time it's acceptance. I mean, it sounds very easy, but usually the easiest, most simple things are the hardest. Because the brain loves prerequisites. It loves to-do lists. It loves methodologies and things that we have to uh, checklist, right? All these, and it's like, if you just stop, things will work. If you just stop, things will work. I was having a conversation the other day uh, with a young lady about her water, and she was asking me about my process. She was kind of where I was um, maybe like 12 years ago. And she's like, well, when you were in this space, what happened? What did you do? What allowed you to make these leaps of faith or at least trust these leaps of faith that you were making? 